are female. 35% live in town, 65% live in the country, but 73% of 106 kids in Plasma Lefebvre have no family involvement in agriculture. Is that a shocking number? I think it's a shocking number, but I think a lot of you know that and experience that as well. But we've got to keep that in mind because these people are talented, they're motivated, they have an interest in agriculture all on their own. We've got to understand how to leverage it. I'm a parent of a millennial, it's not my fault. So I'm going to talk a little bit about millennials and how I think that is influencing the workforce. And we can talk about the things that perhaps we want to talk about. And yeah, millennials, uh, they want a work-life balance. And, and have millennials are addicted to technology and, and they never look up. Or I, I write them instructions in cursive that they can't read it. Or a phone call is a really difficult thing for them to do. How many of you can't call your child but they'll answer a text? That is somehow phones work differently, I guess, from that. We can talk about that, and, but they are a big percentage of our labor pool today. Okay. Now, with that being said, a lot of times when I when I speak, I'm asked, "Are you scared of today's new generation?" And I always think that's interesting because I have to think people older than me thought my generation had challenges, and it's got to be this natural thing. And I'll say, you darn right, I am scared of millennials. And they'll say, why is that? And I said, I am scared about staying ahead of them. A college graduate today, a two-year college graduate, a four-year college graduate, when they enter the workforce, they're more effective and more qualified day one than I, maybe it's just me, but than I was a year group. Between internships and capstone projects and educational curriculum, their ability to make an impact at Vermeer is much, much greater the first week that they're at work. And so we need to embrace that. But in the same reality, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, things that are important to them aren't necessarily how we, those of us that are older, look around here, how we were raised and what was important to us. Anybody agree with that? Anybody feel like there's a difference between how you go about your day and how a 25-year-old goes about their day and their work, it's just simply different. doesn't make it wrong. In fact, I think there's an opportunity to embrace it. You probably can't see these numbers, but this is important for us to recognize as well. This is a group of schools from a conference, not in extreme southern Iowa. This is along the IED corridor in a particular conference, as well as it captures uh, some that are in my area. Take a look at the declining enrollment over the last 10 years at many very nice rural schools. In a lot of cases, it's 25% reduction in the number of students. How many of you are on school boards and have felt the pain of this that's going on? Rural sociology dynamics are intriguing to me because with this, there's a challenge to keep hospitals, there's a, there's a challenge to keep schools, there's a challenge to keep other amenities that can inspire young people to want to be rural with us and be involved in agriculture moving forward. I don't have the answer to this one, we'll talk about it later. This is a significant dynamic because this is where we capture at Premier and where you capture as agriculture retailers or farmers, where you capture some of your uh, opportunities moving forward. Oh, and as is a time, it's just basically saying there's more jobs moving forward than what we've got uh, people moving forward from a workforce perspective. I just, I captured this to talk about all aspects. Somebody driving a tractor, a service technician, a parts person, somebody working cattle, produce farms, uh, processing, a retailer, uh, livestock operation, whatever it may be. There are jobs everywhere. Where, where are the people going to come from? We talk about production agriculture. Here, um, I'll skip that one. This one is interesting to me and something I didn't know and actually as I was preparing for this, the amount of food that's being unharvested in this country right now because of lack of labor is amazing. And so as if we think about immigration policy, and a lot of this is in produce, um, but you'll see here in most countries it continues to increase that there is a, a, a reasonable percentage of food that's being produced 
that's not able to be harvested because the labor is not available. That's a hard concept for me to understand and to get my arms around, but it's real. Production agriculture is estimated to need another 2 million workers in the future. This doesn't affect us necessarily in the audience that's here today, but take a look at the percentage of the farming op produce operation of their total cost as labor. That is a significant amount. 50 to 75 percent of that labor today is unauthorized. And so as, as you quite imagine, with uh, today's movement from a governmental perspective, what's that look like moving forward if there's significant immigration reform? I don't have the answer to it, uh, but I think it's reality. Uh, as we talk about this population growth as well, and uh, again, you're going to see better data probably from your next speaker. By 2100, it's estimated that, that Africa will be nearly 40% of our population. That that, we talk about this growth to 9 or 10 billion, and if you can get it in your mindset that that means just the whole world is going to grow, and the data would say that certain parts of the world are really not going to show, show any growth, and certain parts of the world is really where that extra billion to two billion people are going to come from. So another interesting thing as well. In production agriculture, uh, this is a company that we work with quite closely that builds automated robots. And this was in, Rot in uh, Reuters Magazine, basically saying, gets calls from farmers every day that says, I'm done with this labor headache. Anybody else have a labor headache? Anybody else out here today got a call that somebody can't show up to work, or is late for work, or whatever it may be, or you had somebody all of a sudden uh, resign, and you're in a troubling situation from a livestock or a farming operation? Just worry about the one on the right. This was an interesting uh, data point that I found, or at least comment. Americans believe they have outgrown farm work, and they're willing to accept lower minimum wage jobs rather than agricultural work. If there's anything that we need to be aware of, any comment or any trend, I think this one is significant. Is that kind of hard for your pride to accept? The fact that today's future workforce is not interested in doing agricultural work? It certainly is to me. From a manufacturing perspective, what do you suppose I'm trying to show from this slide? How many of you grew up tinkering on something with your father, on a tractor, a car, or whatever it may be. In manufacturing, we had that experience as well. We were hiring this young man that was out in the garage learning wrenches, learning mechanical type things. Today, we're still welding the same way. We're still tightening the bolts on your new mailers the same way, just like they're doing on tractors. Uh, we're still doing machine shop type things the same way. But we're hiring people that grew up not tinkering. That's who's now building your mailers. Uh, is, now, it doesn't make them bad. They're great, great young people, but it's really, really different. And it's really a challenge for us and understanding how to take non-mechanical aptitude and get to build you a consistent quality product. In retail as well, um, from a, and I'm sure those of you that are retailers, Sinclair and Stutzman's and others that are in the audience know that, that uh, the workforce is difficult uh, to be able to find enough people. Uh, we have dealers that I talk to every day that are stressed about being able to take care of their customers 24-7 based on the labor pool. There's another scenario to this as well. It's a fact from a generalization perspective that the millennial workforce doesn't want to work seven days a week. So we have actually got dealers that are doing the same amount of service work that have had to increase their head count so that they can help millennials balance their work and their life. Again, I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm saying that that's a challenge based on the labor pool uh, that's engaged into what we do uh, today as well. Packing plant, I don't have a lot of information on that, but 50% of packing plants are immigrant workers. And so as we think about the effect on significant labor policy moving forward, what do you suppose our consumers will pay for our meat if wages have to go up significantly? in the packing arena. 
So what are the answers? That's where we'll spend uh, more of the time. This is just bullet points of some of the things that I'm going to talk about. First, and so I'll probably seem a little harsh here, and I'll probably seem a little challenging, uh, but I don't think you come here for a haircut. Uh, you probably come here to try to learn and to be challenged a little bit as well. Uh, one of them is I'll challenge you that if you're not, I think it's, 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 our, it's in our interest as agriculturists that have been blessed uh, by the lives that we've been able to lead, no matter how challenging uh, they may be. It makes me think about when I pulled up early this morning, there was a pickup of a livestock, tra livestock trailer outside, and I thought, he's either here early, or he finally decided to find a more stable life than he's been here gambling on after he went to Sailor. And, uh, but at the same time, I think we know uh, that, that we're an honorable profession. We have to invest back in to that profession as well. We started about six or seven years ago in Pleasantville, we started uh, an FFA alumni organization out of nowhere. A few of us got together and we said that our, our, uh, our chapter is growing. It's tough for our advisor to get everything done. It's tough to get enough resources. Let's create an FFA alumni group. Let's create resources and see if we can impact these kind of great young people so that they can get a true interest in agriculture because for many of them, they don't have parental, not support, but just counsel like we did. These people today aren't spending their, their afternoons like I did getting off the bus and running to the field to ride on the fender of a 560 and thought the world was perfect to be next to my dad for the next until dark to get lights, uh, pull an old four bottom plow and a rickety disc that I loved every last bit of it. They don't have those kinds of opportunities. And so we were able to round up enough money from industry and different things that we've done. And our initial focus was we built an FFA farm. We had somebody donate an acreage right outside of town, walking distance for our students that live in town. And we thought at the time that we needed to create, similar to what we see in Texas, and I just got done judging in Perry, Georgia not too long ago, the city of Perry, that's the size of Des Moines, has got six FFA farms inside the city limits that these young people can go learn things from. So we thought people would perhaps have a pig to show at the fair, or a goat, or whatever it may be, but it's really more involved to, to class projects. So every class is a project. The freshmen are raising pigs, the sophomores have a cattle project, the juniors have a crop project, and the way that we design that is, is the student has to propose to the alumni their business plan. And so they have to work with their advisor and those of us in the area that may have some expertise in that area, and they've got to propose, they've got to go borrow the money, uh, not from pills, uh, we're too far away, so sorry about that, have to borrow the money and they do the chores. And I've been out of this farm at times at daylight, and I'd like to say because I'm a heroic heavy worker, it's the fact that I'm highly unorganized, so I was trying to get stuff done that I should already have done. And to see a car pull up with a very sleepy mother <coughs> delivering her child to do pig chores, and that person is getting out earlier, you know, all the rest of their friends are asleep, I guarantee you. Or play and still play video games from the night before. And they're getting out to go take care of animals because it's their responsibility for the day. And many of those at times will stop when they're done choring and tell me about how the, how the pigs are doing. And so what that's developed into is that now it's developed into a marketing component where those, those animals are harvested and sold all in our local community as a branded meat product. And to meet one of the really cool things about this next generation that want to give back and they want to be a part of something big, a portion of all the meat harvested goes to need families within our community. And I've watched kids walk from the trailer port where they didn't have a ride. They walk a mile and they spend all day there because it's a good feeling for them to be responsible for something and to be responsible for animals. And so, um, you'll see here, that's unloading the meat, getting ready to be delivered. Um, that we cut off the picture, but there were two gals involved in loading this manure spreader. The bigger picture shows two on their phones right behind it. So that still exists, for sure. And more power to them, but they gotta figure out how to, how to delegate. I guess that's a part of good things in the future. Um, 
The upper right hand corner is, is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, that's our ag instructor overlooking these young students write a check at the sale barn for what they just invested in. And my next favorite picture, we also remodeled their classroom there, and uh, that's me standing back there like 20 pounds ago. And then the learning center also is our opportunity to do a lot of elementary, um, learn the farm and safety teaching there. And then this one right here is, is my other favorite picture. Here's a young man that's a junior with zero agriculture experience reporting out to the alumni their break-even and their profitability from their project. And diving into things that they did right and things that they did wrong in production agriculture. That would have never happened without what we have, and I'm not bragging, there's a lot of other people that have been the primary drivers of this. Uh, but I would challenge you in your local area, if you want to make sure that there are future people you can help depend on in your agriculture operation, whether it's a retailer, a dealership, a farm, invest in the future. The other thing that I, there's an opportunity to invest in as well is there's a case curriculum uh, that's kind of unknown out there. Uh, that is, uh, every ag teacher that wants to teach the different parts of that has to be certified. There's dollars involved in that. I don't know if you've happened to notice lately, but the legislature and I, legislature and I was not providing excessive funds to public schools right now. And so those things can be difficult. But it covers a lot of areas. And if you look there, animal science, plant science, power and technology, and natural resources, those can only be taught once a teacher is certified. So as ag equipment manufacturers, we're heavily involved in providing scholarships right now so that many ag teachers can teach power and technology. But I also think that can be a part of your local support to try to help these young people continue their interest in agriculture. So disruptive technologies, seeing how long I'm glad I'm here. I'm going to talk about several things here. Um, but while this video is going, we're going to talk about automation here later. Uh, we're starting down a path of significant automation at Vermeer. These are called AGVs that move around on their own and pull parts to the assembly line as they're needed. And guess what? None of them got the flu this year. And when you stop there during break or lunch, they're just like happy little robots running around the factory taking care of business. Now, is that cool or is that scary? I bet in the audience it's a 50-50. I bet there's, wow, what are those poor, what are those people doing that, that used to do those jobs, right? Is that a reality to that? <coughs> when Case launched that tractor, or at least the concept tractor, I read a lot of the social media. There was just as much social media saying, wow, I hate it. That, that's going to take jobs away from the public as there were that, wow, I can't wait to embrace that technology. And we'll come back to that here, here in a minute. It's interesting enough, the fact is we're going to have to have automation. And you'll see here in a minute a quote. I'll just go ahead and talk about it. A third of the jobs that exist in this country today did not exist 25 years ago. The types of jobs, not number of jobs. So we can be scared of automation, and we can fear it, and we can perhaps not believe it, but if we want to grow as an economy, we're going to have to embrace it, and we're going to have to assume that our economy will adjust based on that. I remember to the day, and, and I'll drive to Cedar Rapids tonight and then fly to Houston, and I'll walk in, and I'll go to a machine and check in, right? And I remember the day that I had, they walked me back from the human to a kiosk, and I was mad as heck at TWA. I was glad they were going broke at that point. But I can't imagine going back and talking to a human then. And I often thought, my gosh, what is this doing to this place? I don't know, 100,000 of those people at the counter, or 200,000 around the country? But what's, that was probably 15 years ago. What's our unemployment rate today? Virtually, virtually none. Jobs are created each and every day based on technologies that are available. So we cannot be afraid of automation, in my mind, in the future. 
Can we go ahead and show that video, please? I mean, the second or third one. He says, you're the last one, then you're behind mine. I guess turned out the vector, we thought it would be good, but we didn't realize it would be this good. Like, it's been an incredible, incredible investment. Hi there, I'm uh, Weldon Cliff from uh, Sunnygate Farms, Bloomberg, Manitoba, Canada. In the last 15 years of dairying before robots, it was just go, go, go. Get this done, get that, uh, get that done. There was very little time to enjoy your cows. And all those robots, I can actually go in there and I can look at my cows, I can pet my cows, I can, I can interact with my cows, and there's time for it. Before, we uh, were milking at high school, and, and I guess we felt that we we knew our cows, we knew where they stood, we knew what each cow was all about, or we thought we did. And I guess moving into automation and all that, we thought we would uh, lose that personal touch. And really, uh, we know our cows much better now than we ever have. There's uh, well over 100 pieces of information we get every time the cow enters a robot. We know uh, how much milk she gives, how, what her butter fat is, what her protein is, what her cell phone is, the temperature of her milk, has she been active, has she not been active, is, is her stomach working with the rumination tags. It's, it's unbelievable the amount of information that we get now. Like we thought we used to know our cows, and now we found that we didn't really know them at all before. Like, like it's just unreal how relaxed they are, and, and again, that relaxed cows just give more milk. Our butter fat usually is at 3.8 with a protein of 3.3 roughly. Milk is at 32 to 33 liters per cow right How many of you have ever been in a dairy with a robot or an owner robot? Some of you in here. I can't comprehend what it was like. And this, the head of this company, the owner and I, I'm blessed to be a good friend of his from the Netherlands. His goal is, and they're pretty much got there, that a 75 or 100 hair dairy needs one total person to run that dairy. And I can't fathom 20 years ago when somebody in his organization said, I think we can milk a cow with a robot. When you walk in these barns and there's no humans, and cows are actually standing in line, which I think is intriguing. I go to China a lot, they don't even know how to stand in line. The cows are standing in line, waiting to be milked. The family's outside doing other things, or they're in, what, what do you say he's using with his time? He's studying the data trying to build a better dairy. And I know a lot of us, we think about autonomous tractors, saying, I'd love to be on a tractor. I can't imagine not doing that. And I'm here anyway. What else am I going to do? If six hours a day, for instance, were taken away from, uh, from driving a tractor, how could you redirect your time to build a better business? How could you be meeting with your bankers? How could you be studying the data? How can you be working meeting with agronomists? How can you be hand-holding landlords, which is an important part of what we do each and every day? And, and in fact, I would argue those robots are better at milking than humans, and eventually equipment's going to be better at driving and planting corn than you are today. And you may not want to hear that, but I know enough about this technology. I think if you would ever bust through the gates and look at back at Vermeer, if you think the supper bell bather's pretty cool, Wait till you stumble on, you won't right now unless you get a key. Wait till you stumble on the next invention that we can embrace automation and, and autonomous. So it, it is a reality of, of our future. And as I talked about here, um, uh, I'm, I've got my mindset in the place that I believe that, that robots, I heard a speaker the other day say, we'll have to tax robots to pay people to sit at home. I don't believe that in a heartbeat. I think our economies will change. The things that we focus on will change. And there will be other jobs uh, that will be a result of automation in the future. Here's one here as well. I mentioned that uh, there's a lot of uh, today's cool that want to be their own master. So what these folks are saying by this, how many of you have had to use Uber? Not huge in Iowa yet. I use it all the time. Why people love Uber from, a, from an Uber driver perspective is they are their own master. If you talk to these people, why they do it? They do it because they can, they can turn their system on when they want to work and they need some cash. They can turn their system off when they don't want to work and they don't need cash. That's what drives them. And we're seeing a higher percentage of the labor pool, we believe, moving forward, that want that kind of flexibility. Now, 
Mark, I didn't know Elvis Dustin very well, but I'm trying to contemplate somebody of that era interviewing a future employee, and the employee says, Mr. Stutzman, I'm going to be my own master, but I'd like to work for you. I'm trying to get that through my head. But I believe it's a part, and we can embrace that instead of fight it moving forward. Coca-Cola's got a project now where you can be randomly driving around, and if you're on their system, and their truck, or their truck driver just, just dumped off a whole pile of coke to put on shelves. You can go into the, the Sam's and stock the shelves for a couple hours and get some money. And then leave. I'm getting my hair cut the other day. And you know, this probably looks like a high price haircut. It was actually an $11 haircut at Great Clips of Pella. And I heard one of them say, I'm going to the mall in West Des Moines. I'll turn my system on in case they're having to be backed up and I can get a couple hours of work at the great place next to the mall. But think about what that could be like in the future. Think about if you've got an app 10 years from now and all of a sudden you're way behind in paying or way behind in processing cattle or whatever it may be and you can ping the app and somebody shows up and wants to do a few hours of work. That is pretty appealing to me. Now, we could argue and say, well, they'll be doorknobs. They won't know what they're doing. Uh, they'll, just, they'll just be wasteful. I don't believe necessarily that that will be true. But I think there's ways that we can create and we can embrace a variable work culture that could be golden for a lot of operations like mine that are not where we don't have 20 employees. Uh, we've virtually got ourselves. But at times, we need help. I'm guessing that's running way over your head saying I can't imagine bringing a random person in. We'll, we'll jump into a vehicle and drive eight mile an hour with a random person. But perhaps we won't embrace the fact that somebody can come string wire and help us build a fence. I believe it's a part of the future. Now I'm going to get way out there for a few minutes before I'm done. And I'm going to talk about something that's more radical, but I also think it's part of our future as well. Anybody heard the word Kaizen at all? got some people in the room. Kaizen is a Japanese term uh, that's been heavily embraced by that culture. It's been a part of why the Toyotas of the world uh, have been so successful. I would say Kubota as well, but they're competitors. So I'm not going to say it. Kaizen means change for the better. Okay? And really what it's about is about two functions. One is continuous improvement. And it's a, it's a non-stop looking at removing unnecessary activities and variations. How many of you on your farms today or in your retail stores have unnecessary actions that are going on each and every day? Do you have those? I think you do. We all do. Lean is the relentless pursuit of eliminating waste. We embrace this. Um, and this is our sales history over time, with the sales numbers off there. But we embraced this in about 2000. And the blue number there is how many people are employed at Vermeer. So if you go out in the 2014-2015 time frame, we've grown at times 40% with the same number of people that we had before by this. So, as a farmer, you're sitting here and saying, all right, then why did my equipment not go down in price? Um, the, way to, the way to feel better about that is our equipment would have had to go up in price if we wouldn't have been intense at eliminating waste and driving for continuous improvement. So I'm really not talking about this from a manufacturing perspective. I'm challenging those of you in production agriculture or livestock production to perhaps embrace the principles of a relentless pursuit to reduce waste in your operations. So there's the 5S component, and I feel horrible about speaking about this because this is not an area that we're strong with on our farm, and so maybe, but I also know the benefits of this. So what 5S is, it's basically removing unnecessary items, designating a home for every item, how many of you have a home for every item on your farm? I want to meet you. you. I got three hats, for I said. I'd like to know that. That's a very difficult thing to do. Make it visual and put things back to use after after use. Eliminate non-value effort. 
and then the tough part is sustaining it. How many of you have a, a tool drawer that looks like this that you or your people are working from, trying to do work? Is that a pretty typical look? Which one do you think would be more efficient? This one or uh, I'll go right to it. Or this one. This one, right? It's common sense. But how hard is it for us to slow down our operations and say, you know what? We're going to study the waste and we're going to make investments and we're going to take time to reduce the waste that we do. And I'll challenge you. You may say, well, all that's going to do is reduce 10% of, of, of my day or my people's day. Think about it, about what you can redirect that 10% of your time to do. What part of your business could you go spend more time with that's going to make you more money than sorting the tools? Pretty much anything, right? Heck, come to the casino if you want. Anything, perhaps, can add more value than the waste that we create by not being organized in what we do. This one cracks me up. This is real at Vermeer. Behind there, there's, there's, a, there's a computer system, supposedly. So we spent the effort, removed all the unused cables, labeled, routed, and organized cables, and then maintained it. That's what it looks like today. If the person was still here, still there to charge it, we would show it to them. No, they, they survived this. But that's the difference in, in the intense look that we take each and every day to try to make life better. You know, I mentioned the other day a new acronym in Vermeer that I heard somebody talk about. It's PITB, pain in the butt. And I believe there are a lot of pain in the butts that we put our labor, our, our workers and our colleagues through today that perhaps don't make a big difference in our financial statement at the end of the month, but they make a difference in their attitude. And in today's world, you know, 100% attitude doesn't quite make you competitive. 105 or 110% is what gets you there. Anybody's office like this or worse? Most of ours? Do we think, and I'm not going to go through this, do you think there's an advantage of this? I'm a perfect example in creating this presentation. My computer files are not 5S. This presentation would have taken 10% of the time to create if I could have found the darn pictures. Right? Any of you there? Luckily, I've got daughters uh, that know where some of those are and assistants. That's not the right thing to do with. Spend the time to organize yourself and be less frustrated. So, 5S, and I truly believe this on your farms, if you would just take a little principle of this and pull back from your daily activities, tell the feed salesman to go away for the day when they stop, the seed salesman, you're going to focus on eliminating waste in your business so that you can be more safe, you can produce a better quality, you can be more productive, and your teams and your people, whether it's just even your family, will be more engaged. We talk about a lot about this right here, and that is there's different activities that we do, and I think you do in your businesses as well. Some of them add value. Some of them are necessary non-value added. So think about some of the stuff the bank needs to fill out. I would consider that necessary non-value at the time. I'm at a bank where I can say that. Think about government paperwork, the stuff you have to do, right? That doesn't really add value to the product that you're producing. The problem is the number of things we do that are not value added, and I guarantee you that they're big. Here's an example. We do this nearly every every uh, week, where we those lines, that's a person's travel time to assemble a baler. So any time that they're moving around the baler and not working on the baler, do you think that's value added or not value added? That is non-value added. You're, you are not going to pay us for making laps around a bailer or trying to find tools or trying to get access to information to build the bailer. You're not going to pay for that. You're going to pay for when we stop and put a bearing on that bailer. That's what you're going to pay for. Your customers are the same way. Here's an interesting video here. Can you switch to that one? <laughs>
comes out and tells him what he's doing wrong. You see that come out and check the field, stop the cab. If you'll notice later on in the bailing scenario, I'm pretty sure they also have to take a bio break uh, as well. So I'm not sure a cab I'm not sure how to fix that waste. But the reason I talk about this, I think if, if you time lapse your farming operation, you would like, my gosh, why are we doing those things? How many of you identified some areas of waste in here? When you were watching it, right? It's natural. The machine plugged a couple times. They were turning around in the corners. We're using this to try to build you better equipment. You could use this to identify waste that you probably can't see when it's not in a, in a, in a way to look at it from a time-lapse perspective. I was thinking about this the other day. We're processing baby calves every day right now. And for some reason, we think it makes sense to have part of each of the things we're using two different farms. Right? I guarantee you there's a half hour a day that we could be studying our next <coughs> genetic decisions to build better cattle instead of walking to two different places to get a few drugs to, to vaccinate cattle. It happens to us each and every day. Um, but yeah, it'd be fun if we had time to talk about all the waste you see here. Uh, the fact is, they're backing up to drop a bale, right? Sheer waste. There's no, that doesn't make a better bale. That's just the way equipment is built today. Unless you buy a new supplement. That's the way equipment is, bailed, is built today, and it essentially creates waste. So I'm about out of time. Um, I'm going to skip through these and finish here. Um, but what I'll say at the end, this is more about a, a career academy that we have in Pella that's been established as a pretty cool opportunity as well. So, you know, as you can tell, I'm passionate about it. I, I have concerns about where labor is going to come from and all those aspects of what we do in agriculture in the future. But I've got a pile of optimism. I've got, and I don't know these young people sitting here, these people are going to make a difference in agriculture if we invest in them. And I think we're going to have to embrace automation. We're going to have to take disruptive technologies. I didn't mention the fact that we've got dealers now delivering parts with Uber. So would you rather pay an Uber 30 bucks to deliver a part? or take two or three hours to drive to a dealership and wait in line and get the part. Uh, they're embracing disruptive technologies. And I think the, you know, the world's in front of us in terms of opportunity, but we're going to have to think different. And if there's anything that I can say is if you could go back home, this group here produces a big chunk. You know, when I fly over these flyover states, when I fly back home or out of home, I'm mesmerized by looking out the window and thinking the percentage of the total food in this world that's produced in these Midwestern states is just humble. There's no doubt about it. But decisions in this room won't drive the world, but we can drive the world locally to impact the next generation so that we've got people to bring into our businesses, we've got people to handle our businesses over. And so if I can challenge you about anything, it's to go back home and invest in your local communities. Uh, to help inspire these young agriculturists that may not have the support, but they've got all the love for the business that you can possibly imagine. So feel free to text me, call me, email me, tell me I'm a doorknob, that's horrible and boring. Um, whatever you want to say, uh, thanks for being here. I'll be around all day. Uh, be fun to be able to chat with you. So again, thanks for the opportunity.